Next, Daughters of the American Revolution talk about preservation and pride. Then, the Wounded Warrior Dogs Project. A look at a flying ace. And, meet the first female commander of an Ohio Air National Guard wing. That's Columbus Neighborhoods next, so stay tuned. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Walk around any state house anywhere and images of war heroes gone by are cast in bronze for us to remember and honor their lives. Restoring and maintaining sites like this one is work that is often behind the scenes and rarely recognized. Charlene Brown visits with three daughters of the American Revolution to discover the work they do in historic preservation and education. Tucked away in Upper Arlington, La Chatelaine offers a slice of French fare to Columbus along with its locations in Worthington and Dublin. The bakery air is filled daily with aromas of artisanal breads and pastries made with the best ingredients available, and the dining menu offers authentic, rustic dishes straight out of a French cookbook. It's the perfect setting to meet with a group of ladies today who have a special connection to the American Revolution. All of you are members of the DAR, and um, first thing I'd like to know, what, what are the, the requirements to become a member? Well, I think the main requirement is to prove your lineage. That requires a, a proof of some, of some way, either through a will or through death certificates. Um, I think those are probably the most common methods to show that your, each generation is linked. Okay, so you had an ancestor who was a Minuteman? Yes. All right, and what about you, Sharon, your ancestor? I have two. One was a captain um, who served at Valley Forge and Brandywine. The other one was from Maryland, and he simply signed an uh, oath of allegiance to the state of Maryland at the time of the revolution. You just need something to show that your ancestor was a patriot. They don't necessarily have to have served in the military. So Megan, what about you? Well, I have an ancestor, John Porter, who um, I think had lived in Maryland but served out of Bedford County, Pennsylvania, um, under Paxton, I believe. But uh, that's the line that I've proved so far. But I have another ancestor that I'm trying to find. Um, Tell me, what what is it that your organization does overall? What is your mission? What are some of the core things that you do? We have three, right? Mm -hmm. God, home, and country. So any event that we would plan or help would fall under one of those categories. It's very broad. One of the things our chapter does is we host what we call a reception or a tea twice a year for new citizens. As people become citizens of the United States, we're there for their swearing-in ceremonies and then welcome them as citizens. And, and uh, Megan, what was it that drew you to join the Daughters of the American Revolution? What drew me first was the genealogical aspect. I had heard about the records that they had and thought this was a great opportunity to see what is what records they might have that might help me with my search. And upon pulling up the website, I said, well, there are a lot of things on this website and the organization stands for that 
I felt very passionately about, such as the patriotism and supporting our servicemen and women, um, both serving overseas currently, but also the veterans who had served previously, uh, promoting the education. Now, on, as far as the education, does that mean um, your members go out and they talk to schools or talk to civic groups um, about history? or You could kind of match it to, to your own um, experiences. For example, I'm a, t a retired teacher um, and one of our committees is literacy. And so our chapter um, began collecting books for the YWCA homeless shelter and we provided the children who were there in the shelter with over 400 new books. We also have an essay contest for students who will write about some, um, some happening in history. We'll have a chapter winner and a state winner and so on all the way up to the national winner. I know from its founding until fairly recent times, the DAR did not accept people of color. It was a, an all-white organization. Um, I also read that that changed, and I wonder if any of you could address what it was that caused that change to, to open it up to African Americans, to Native Americans, to people of color. I think a lot of it is the changing in society from when it was first founded. Mm -hmm. It was founded back in the 1890s, so it's a different time than it was then. I know that there are quite a few of, uh, African American members, yes. and we're all looking forward to 250 years from the signing okay. of the Declaration, so there, we're hoping that more people will decide they'd like to join us because we are so different in our viewpoints. We're not all the same ethnic background or even the same political background. We all, we're all very different, but we all come together to work together for a common cause. Why is it important to all of you to, to preserve that legacy of, of your ties to the American Revolution? What, what is it? Anybody? I think that all Americans are proud of the American Revolution. We love the story. We love the idea of it being for freedom for all people. And so if you have an ancestor that was involved in some little way or a big way, it just gives you more ownership to that whole story. Well, it's been great talking to all of you. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. And um, it, it's great to know more about this organization and, and what it is you all are trying to do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> great. <laughs>tribute to four-legged soldiers, then a World War I flying ace, and the first female commander of an Ohio Air National Guard wing. This next story is about a Central Ohio artist who works to raise awareness of the sacrifice and needs of wounded veterans. I've always been working with dogs since 1985, and uh, I've always told stories with dogs, allegory. With the increased triage and medical technology, and the better medical technology, there are more soldiers surviving with uh, worse wounds and injuries. And so visually, as, a, as an artist, I tend to react to things visually. So I decided to do this to tell the story of the wounded veteran through man's best friend, his companion, and what could be a better companion than his service dog, his, the, the war dog that accompanies him uh, in battle. For the um, Afghanistan wounded warrior, it was a, uh, an amp a double amputee that had lost both legs due to an explosion under the Humvee. With the uh, Iraqi uh, 
a soldier who's missing a leg and, 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 and the dog's missing an ear, has a metal plate in the head, is blind in one eye, is from a side explosion of an IED. So these were, a lot of times, these are typical wounds that the soldiers are returning with from these particular campaigns. The seventh dog is actually, um, it's, it's, not, it's not really a dog, but it's a flag draped coffin that was inspired by a video I saw of, this, of the caskets coming off of a Delta flight. And a flag draped human casket came off the flight followed by a small box, which was his dog. The primary installation was seven dogs, including the flag draped casket. So I'm, I'm, and I'm working on one which I, they were all physical injuries, so I'm getting the one which is a psychological in, injury done, the PTS dog, done in time for the exhibition. So that will be the eighth dog. Wounded Warrior Six has, it represents a World War II veteran, a World War II veteran that has passed on, um, and that just has a single dove on the back, it's called Blessing and Mercy. Whereas this one is going to have a, 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 white, a, a white dove and a black dove sitting on the back, just sort of facing each other off, which will be uh, symbolic of, of a conflicting spirits. Not only is this going to be uh, describing PTSD, but there's also an amputation here involved with this. And I don't think I'm going to put a service ribbon on the collar like I have the other dogs each have a service ribbon representing the conflict that they were in. This is more about the soldier who's come home. Boy, what I was not aware of was the emotional impact that this display would have. Many veterans want to see this in a national location where they can see it again. So I'm hoping to get it acquired by a national gallery. So we're going to work on that. Well, Jim's been a member of Ohio Designer Craftsman for f over 40 years. So we've known him for uh, forever. We really wanted to have more of an interactive reception. Um, and one of the dogs that you'll see in the exhibition is Alex. Uh, he was commissioned by the Delaware County Sheriff's Office, Jim was, to make um, a likeness of their dog, Alex. When we were looking at the Wounded Warrior dogs, we knew we needed more to the exhibition and Jim's been doing sculpture since uh, 1970s and he's done a lot of dogs, other dogs that are a little more humorous than what you'll see with the Wounded Warrior dogs. And we really thought just to bring it all together would be great to have other dogs that are a little more fun, uh, to bring a little more levity to the installation itself, and to show what other, uh, how dogs provide different types of service to humans. Next, Columbus native and World War I hero, Eddie Rickenbacker. Then, a first for the Ohio Air National Guard. Eddie Rickenbacker was born right here in Columbus. He became a flying ace in World War I and later was the president of Eastern Airlines. Let's head to the vault at the Ohio History Connection to find out more. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Looks like the table's set to serve up a helping of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker memorabilia. It is. A lot of people think he is Columbus's most famous German-American, but that's not quite true, is it? That's not quite true. You're right. He was born in Columbus, but he was born uh, to Swiss immigrants. 
And we think of him as the famous World War I aviator, but uh, he was famous before that with the work he started in Columbus, right? Absolutely. He was a famous race car driver before he became famous for his World War I exploits. He was working as a mechanic, um, but then he got into professional racing and he actually raced in the Indy 500 four times. Um, so even before he got involved in the war effort, people knew about him. What was his, what did he do going into World War I? Did he start as an aviator? He didn't. He actually started as a professional driver for General John Pershing, who was the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces during World War I. So he served as his professional chauffeur before he moved into flight school and eventually commanded the 94th Aero Squadron. And he became the leading aviator, the ace of aces for the for the uh, United States, correct? He did, yes. That was his nickname during World War I, the Ace of Aces. He was the most successful American fighter pilot. He had 26 aerial victories, which means he downed 26 aircrafts, um, which was more than any other American pilot during the war. And uh, some of the, this is all connected to his aviation career in World War I, is that correct? It is, yes. So what we have here, we have a machine gun that came off of a German plane. Um, and then right next to it, we have a compass, also from German aircraft. And then these are an example, they're not from Eddie, but they're an example of what an aviator during World War I would have worn at the time. And like a lot of our World War I collections, they were brought over uh, after the soldiers came back from mm -hmm. conflict. They brought their souvenirs with them. And thankfully, many of those souvenirs were donated to our organization. So they're here for people to view anytime they visit the Ohio History Center. I read that among uh, Eddie's victories were balloons that were used for reconnaissance and observation. Yes, yes, yes. In addition to the the planes that he brought down, he did bring down a few balloons. So he was a very successful pilot. What did he do after the war? Did he come back to Columbus? He did. He came back to Columbus and he became an entrepreneur. Um, he owned uh, several airlines. Eastern Airlines is probably the most notable, the one people are most familiar with. But he wasn't done with his military career after he left World War I. He was back at it during World War II, getting into some of the same success that he got during that first World War. There's a story that people tell about Eddie Rickenbacker where he was, uh, he was involved in a plane crash, stranded at sea for 21 days and he's credited with saving the lives of many men from that airplane crash. They survived on water that was rationed from rain and uh, they fished with a seagull that they caught. And many of the men that uh, survived, they credited Eddie Rickenbacker with, with their being around. Very famous story, they made a movie about him and Fred McMurray played Eddie Rickenbacker. Oh, I didn't You're know that. You're too young to know Fred McMurray, but <laughs> people my age know Fred McMurray. Yeah. He's pretty famous. You know, Eddie Rickenbacker was really almost like a modern superhero at that time. He was uh, very famous for, you know, the things that he did during the war um, and, uh, and, and otherwise. This has got to be one of the most popular things people could see at uh, OHC, I bet, when they come to see Eddie Rickenbacker's. Stuff. Yes, yes, you know, he's very popular amongst, amongst our visitors and, and we have a lot of collections of his which we're very glad to be able to preserve and share with all of our visitors all across Ohio. Um, so it's a great story to tell and we're glad that you're interested. Well, thanks for sharing these, these are terrific. Thank you so much, Brent. Craft beer is big in Columbus. Ever wonder how we ranked alongside big brewing cities like Portland? Find out about that story and more at Curious Sea Bus, where you submit a question online, and if voters agree, we report the story together. Look for stories, submit a question, or log on for a voting round at wosu.org slash curious. Now we have a living hero for you. Colonel Allison Miller, the first female commander of an Air National Guard wing, talks about leading the 179th Airlift Wing in Mansfield and why she chose a career in the military. I always wanted to be an astronaut. And I thought, wait, the fastest way to be an astronaut is to be a pilot. So I altered course my senior year and went from a Chem E major to an aviation major and just instantly fell in love. I'm not an astronaut, but I sure do love the, uh, the path that I've taken with flying. 
After 9-11, and we were up flying caps all over the country when no other aircraft were allowed to be in the skies, transitioning all the way through many deployments that I've had over the skies of Afghanistan, it really just changes your perspective, not only of flying, but really of life, when you look down and just see that what we're doing when we're up flying is really protecting. And a lot of people may not see it that way. They may not view us as it's just a constant protection that we provide, but that's really what it is. The 179th Airlift Wing has about 1,400 members. 300 of those are with our Red Horse Squadron and detachment that is a civil engineering group with us. 1,100 of those are members of the 179th Airlift Wing. We have about 300 members here during the week, and then the other 800 come in on a drill weekend. We have eight C-130 aircraft, and the C-130 is mainly built for cargo and people, and our mission goes worldwide. We have the ability to land on a dirt strip. We can push cargo out the back with a parachute and get it to places that maybe we can't land an airplane, and we can also haul our own folks in the Air National Guard, the Air Force, or the Army. A year ago, the 179th directly supported Texas, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands in the hurricane relief. Back in April, we did a five-ship formation, which is an incredible feat when you only have eight airplanes on your ramp, and some of those are going through uh, maintenance, short-term and long-term maintenance. So to be able to launch a five-ship, number one, is absolutely incredible. Number two, it's a huge morale builder for your folks. So it was an absolute honor to watch five airplanes get off the ground at the same time. And it was really neat around the city. We kind of let folks know that it was gonna happen. And so it kind of incorporated our citizens around Mansfield as well. To be honest with you, there's no typical day here. Every day is, is different. Every day is unique and challenging. I try not to stay in this office. Very often I try to get out um, and just meet with folks. An average day on the flight line here, they may be doing a formation flight, they may be doing an airdrop, they may be practicing assault landings. They have such a unique skill set that they have to maintain, so it's, it's fun to watch. So when I uh, was asked to take command of the 179th Airlift Wing, it's one of those moments, and as I look back on it, even though it was just eight months ago, and I look back on my career at things that I've been asked to do, our military is really great at stretching us and giving us positions that we can grow into, and that knowing that they have the confidence that we'll do the job to the best of our ability. Uh, and that's kind of the way I view the role here at the 179th. If you had asked me 20 years ago if this would have been my path, I probably would never have guessed it. But I truly value each life, each airman that's in this wing, and it's an incredible opportunity to lead them. Females are typically about 10% in everything that we do. As I talk to different groups, and it doesn't have to just be females or, or young girls, but anybody that's a minority, I want them to know that absolutely uh, you can set goals and dream. But the more important thing that I've realized over the past 23 years is to not pass up an opportunity. So isn't that pretty cool that they're trusting you? There's nothing like serving in the Air National Guard because you get to serve the community that you live in. And we make that decision to serve based on friends and family. And I'll tell you, I tell my children, I have three kids, I tell them every single day how grateful I am for them because it's not just me putting on the uniform but they also have served for the entire span of their life. Oldest is 17 and my youngest is 13. And my daughter calculated I've been gone over six and a half years of her life. And so when you talk about why I do it, I do it for them, I do it for uh, my family, and then I do it for my community. It absolutely takes a village for me to be able to serve, for one airman to serve. So when you look at a wing like the 179th with 1,400 members and you multiply that by 10, 15, 20 people, sometimes those folks that are in the, in the wings of serving don't view themselves like that. But any opportunity I get to tell a family member thank you, their airman is serving because of their sacrifice as well.
Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Hospitality, blasphemy, your majesty, you party you with Marines. We home, it's on, we in that killing zone. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.